So I trust my gut instincts, and the reason why is because, you know, I always talk about the two pains in life, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Uh, and the saying is, the pain well. of, yeah, the pain of discipline things. goes yeah. away once you taste success, but the pain of regret will haunt you for a lifetime. So I'm 40 years old, but I regret not wrestling that one year in college before they cut the program. I regret not going to Hawaii or even applying to try to get in. I regret, you know, not knowing how to train or not learning how to have a different attitude um, when I had setbacks in high school. You know, I regret lost opportunities. So I'm pissed off for greatness, like Ray Lewis says. Like, I, I'm not into average and some people don't care they let it go but uh i know that i could turn any young athlete not just into a success with the sport but like if i could teach them to overcome those obstacles and all that stuff i know that life will be easier for them they will be more successful they And that was Zach Ebenesh, and this is episode 30 of the Vision Bod Podcast. I'm Tristan Cannell, and alongside me, Johnny Stofko. What's up, everybody? How's everyone doing today? I'm well. How you are doing you, Johnny? Well? I'm doing good. Doing, doing really well? well? Excited to get this, stuff, this show started on the right foot. Definitely. Well, to follow up some of the big episodes we've had lately, we've got uh, Zach Ebenesh. Zach's one of the, the leading strength and conditioning coaches in America. He uh, specializes in helping... Uh, young children, um, going from that sort of high school to college, and uh, he helps prepare them to get into those pros. Yeah, Zach's really done a lot in regards to younger people, younger generation, um, teenagers, specifically, you know, young men trying to sh- strengthen and get more discipline with the wrestling, strength and conditioning. He's, he's a pioneer, pioneer too, of sorts. Definitely. I think what we'll find most intriguing about Zach is just his lovely nature, his great speaker. I think he's just more than a coach. I think that's what he really brings to the table and I think you guys will be very, very pleased with what you hear today. Oh yeah, when I think of Zach, I think a motivator. You know, he's, he's an inspiration and a lot of times when you have guys or girls who promote well-being, promote um, healing the body, sometimes their delivery may not be on point with their message. Zach definitely has that both even in regards to his motivational skills. So I'm excited about this one. Definitely. Before we get Zach on, just a big shout out um, to all our supporters and followers that uh, have been subscribing and leaving us awesome five-star reviews, following us on social media, and really helping us grow. Yeah, Tristan, I really appreciate, you know, I love the support on my page, and then it's awesome when we see it collectively on our vision board pages, on our Twitter pages, on both of our Facebook pages. So from both of us, we'd like to say thank you, and let's just continue this momentum, continue the support so we can continue to uh, bring it. Definitely. Also a big shout out to our major sponsor, Populous. Populous, a consulting management firm that really does help you really just make those firms just get to that next level of growth in their business. Yeah, guys, Populous, what Populous means to me, it means to all their clients, Populous helps people grow they utilize the qualities such as integrity, leadership. They really promote happiness, and they really feel that if you put all these things together, um, you, you could definitely use these things as a catalyst for growth. Definitely. The team at Populous, led by Ro Singh, Gregory Wade, and Kim Donovan, all holding um, experience at, at top-notch firms such as BlackBerry, Telstra, Samsung. These guys are the best of the best. So if you're looking for some advice in terms of ma- making it to your next sort of business goals and you, you might be struggling to, to kickstart your business into the next gear or things like leadership, as Johnny has just said, as well as happiness programs, get in touch with them. They're www.populous.com.au. Also check out The Leadership Show, which they also host on iTunes, YouTube, or SoundCloud. Very excited about this one. Very excited about Populous. Very excited about Zach Evan Tristan. Definitely. Let's do it. Well, let's just get him on, eh? Here is Zach. <laughs> The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell. Yeah, we're good. good. When um, You know what's funny is like you bounced around a lot, Johnny, and uh, I remember um, when uh, 
in high school, all I was thinking about was like, get out of Edison, New Jersey, escape, escape. And then um, I couldn't even get accepted into a college um, away. Um, I, gr- I just didn't have good, I had good grades, but I wasn't uh, in the higher level classes. So I just couldn't even get away. And I remember um, then sophomore year, I was like, I think I'm going to like transfer out and go to like University of Hawaii, somewhere far away, right? Where I was trying to escape. And now that I live in this town that I live in, I also like what you said, John, he's like, I, I'm proud of where I came from. Like you have street cred. <laughs> I, I think like we go to like, you're trying to escape it, trying to escape. It, and then you're like, man, that's the place that shaped me. Um, and you know, kind of gave me some, um, some grit. Yeah. It, it's very important. Uh, it's interesting coming here. Tristan is from, so like, they in Sydney now. Sydney, in my opinion, is one of the most beautiful, isolated places like on Earth. It, it's gorgeous. The people have, I don't want to stereotype or put words in the people's mouth, but they talk about like directional prejudice. Like you're from out west. Um, you know, you know, like this, one of those things. And is, is that where you come from? Yeah, I'm from out west. Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting to see like how important those moments when you're at these fragile years that I think that you need to go through to be a catalyst for when you're an adult. I, I actually heard you talk about that, that um, when you were talking about God, you know, having younger guys and you were coaching, and you were saying sometimes you struggle with if, if you have a kid who maybe never really had to, I guess, go through adversity yet. And Yeah. I'm, like, if you <clears> – you talking to – it hit me – It always hits me when I hear somebody talking about where they come from. So you said, oh, I'm from Youngstown. So from when I hear that, I think of the the 30 for 30 Youngstown boys. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming it's not all bad like that. But you have a pretty, like, this side of the tracks is bad. This side of the tracks is, like, not bad. But, like, you got to have your shit together so you don't get punched in the face. That kind of, like, place, right? Yeah. So uh, I live in this one town where... I think the, a lot of the kids and the people, it's like they live near the beach. They're delusional. Like, it's just like they don't want to leave. But then I'm like, well, not everybody who lives by the beach is like that. Because when you, uh, if you, you've been to Hawaii. Yeah. You've been to Hawaii? Yeah, I've been to Hawaii. I, you have, Tristan. So yeah. when I went to Hawaii many years ago, um, it, was a year, it was like 12 years ago, I, there was no kind of, it seemed like there was no middle class. There was literally like shacks. Yeah, shacks. And, and then there the was, class. yeah, yeah. Yes, and then it was like the, uh, you know, the minority, the people who had the money. And I remember in the earlier years of uh, UFC, a lot of the guys that came out of Hawaii, Hawaii had this huge, back then they called it NHB, No Holds Barred Fighting. And it was like, that's how they settled things. Like, if you and I had a problem in school, it was like, we're going to scrap. Yeah, well. For the surfing, like, it was known that, like, there was very territorial guys would fight. But I feel like if you don't have anything to fight for, to escape, to live for, if you never fight for anything, it, the, the later, the older you get, and I'm talking, like, 13, 14, 15, if you've never had to fight for anything or have some sort of, like, nervous energy about, like, I think I'm going to get beat up in school today. That kid's going to take my lunch money. Mm. Or just these little things, they sound so trivial, but they shape they shape kids differently. So I have kids traveling from all around New Jersey. We've got the two locations. And then what always hits me is um, right now we're near the end of wrestling season. I train a lot of wrestlers. And uh, – I think it was like three years ago, a kid from Camden, New Jersey, won the state title. Camden is one of the most dangerous cities in America, not just New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, how the fuck's this kid win a state title? <laughs> to, to just qualify for the state tournament is like a dream for these kids. They go to Atlantic City. <laughs> it's in this big, uh, bless you, it's in this big, um, it's called Boardwalk Hall. And um, Camden is like, you're not... You don't have a strength coach there. You don't have a wrestling club. You don't have no skills, uh, anybody teaching you. You are like, go to school, and then for you to go home, you're worried about surviving. Literally, I mean, there's shootings and all that shit. I'm like, how the hell did these kids win? Then last year, I see another kid from Camden in the States. I'm like, what the hell? 
And then I started thinking of where some of the best football players come from in New Jersey. A lot of them come from Camden. They play street ball. They're tough. Yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking of ESPN 30 for 30, you guys ever see the U? Oh, yeah. About Miami? So when they resurrected the U, uh, it was because um, it was the first coach, Jimmy, um, I don't follow football enough, but Jimmy the Johnson. first coach, he, he went on to the Dallas Cowboys. But Jimmy he's Johnson, like, you know, yeah. I, yeah, he's like, I stopped um, trying to get kids from out of Florida. I just started going into, like, the projects of Miami. And the parents were like, or the kids would be like, Mommy, Mommy, there's a white man driving through the neighborhood. Like, yeah. <laughs> but he got these guys, and they were ready to fight. Like, they were ready to fight and go to war on the football field or in the streets. And um, I'm not saying we have to grow up in, like, the hood. I moved to this town because it's safe. I saw these kids playing outside, young kids. Their parents aren't watching. It's a pretty – it's safe. But a lot of times I say to myself, shit, like, there's, like, one or two black kids in town. And I always see, like, when a black kid's, like, going down the street, people are, like, <laughs> like yeah. a bunch of idiots. Like, they never saw a black person. Yeah. And it just frustrates me. Yeah. <laughs> it gets what? me mad. I'm mad at myself because I'm like, holy shit, it's so <clears throat> sheltered here. And um, that's why even like personally, I'm okay when things are tough because I feel this fear that if they're not tough, I'm going to be a soft fucking pussy. Yeah. Can I curse on this show? Yeah, man. <laughs> like, that's, for, man. <laughs> that's why the podcast, the podcast platform I love because the, you know, you don't, there's no FCC regulations. As long as you put the E right by your name, you're good. Listen, yeah, yeah. that's all so, you need. You know, I um, sometimes I worry. Like as a parent, uh, did we do the right thing? We come to this safe town. It's very nice here. So we do things <clears throat> for our kids that put them outside their comfort zone. So last week we we're in um, Florida, and uh, my daughter goes to a real intense tennis camp. Very intense. The coaches are really tough. And um, sometimes you're like, wow, that's too much. But then I realize, like, that's why she has <clears throat> developed toughness. That's why she's she can handle and what she's going through now, she, it will, like, train her for the rest of her life. And then my son, we went to a wrestling club at American Top Team. And a friend of mine coaches the wrestlers there. <clears throat> and it was tough. And he got beat up. And normally I'm really chill with my kids like I'm I don't get all worked up over things they're very young but on the second day it wasn't wasn't a good day and I was I told them how like disappointed I was I said you have to fight like you have to work hard it's you're gonna be tired this that but you never perform the way you performed and my wife said to somebody she's like Zach never gets upset <laughs> and I was upset because I think like effort is this yeah. equalizer that as long as I just bust my ass and do my best, I'm competitive, so I want to win at everything I do. But from like a standpoint of just teaching people about life, you know, nobody could take away your effort. Like you own that. So if you were, if you left five percent at the gym or one percent, or you half-hearted it that day in business life, now you own that too. And and I think like if you just fight. You know, if you just fight with everything you got, whatever you do, yeah. then, you know, that's an internal win right there. Uh, John Wooden used to say that to his basketball players. They said, they said he never yelled at the UC UCLA players, but he would say, all you guys have to do is your best. And if you win by the points on the board, but you didn't do your best, he's like, you did not win. Yeah, he's yeah. like, that's not a true win. So I look at things like that. You know, in life, and I try to teach that to my kids. And how old's your son? You know, he's seven. He's, he's seven. seven and a, you, you, seven and a half, and he's been home. We got home Sunday night, and he's been home uh, sick since like he, mon well Monday. I he went to school. It just didn't kind of hit me. He normally eats a big breakfast. He didn't eat, yeah. and then he came home Monday. He's like, I just want to lay down. I'm like, damn, that's not like him at all. <clears throat> My wife's a lot smarter than me. She took his temperature. She's like, oh, <laughs> shit, he's fucking sick. Dude, I'm like, oh my god, I'm a fucking idiot. We didn't have the temperature. My mother would do the whole the whole hand thing. Johnny, come yes, over here. Are you sick? And it was like the Chris Rock bit. 
The only medicine we had was Robitussin, but it wasn't the like the normal Robitussin. It was the off brand. Do you ever see that bit he goes on about like yeah, yeah. I got dude, a broken? That shit would like yeah. get you drunk in a way. Like you didn't know what the fuck was going yeah. on. It's like it's like, Daddy, I broke my arm. Which guess what? Pour some Robitussin on it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, that that old school mentality. What you were just talking about the Tris and I, we were uh, chatting with um, Tate, and we saw uh, Fletcher. And, yes. and he, he kind of w- was talking about something that resonated with both of us is he was saying he lives by this, this credo of I need you to try. And, yeah. and I remember him questioning him on that because I was involved in the leadership company for a while and we used to avoid the word try. We used to say the word try is a powerless word. And, and Tate said, yeah, that's true. But in the context that I'm saying it in, it's not about you. I need you to try so I could be better. So, so, so I could do better by you doing better. And it's like the effort you're talking about. Um, no one controls that but us, you, the yes. individual. And I, yeah, like you, that's really important in terms of like. I think um, like he, the way uh, Tate kind of words it is like he's saying I need you to try because I think what he sees is a lot of people, they have this, and I, and I don't like to use the word, the past few months potential we all have this potential to be better yet we just let it kind of sit in you know we you know we go to the grave with it there's that one um Les Brown. Uh, motivation motivational uh speed was it jim Rohn? Les he's like brown. Or, uh, Les brown yeah. he's like the richest place in the great in the world is the graveyard because yeah. people go and look i'm not i don't ever i want to be very transparent like sometimes i don't want to try sometimes i want to quit Sometimes I don't even want to do X, Y, Z. And there are now times where, like, I realize <clears throat> it, there, there are times where I will quit things that are adding a lot of, like, drama, negativity to me. And I don't want that shit in my life. But Tate says, like, I need you to try because we're all capable of being better. And uh, him and I had this conversation because I said to him, I go, do you ever just want to quit? Like, do you ever mm-hmm. just not want to do whatever it is that you're doing? And I'm sure... There's got to be times where Tate feels that way, right? He's an actor. You go on all these uh, auditions, and I, I'm sure there's many, many people saying no before finally one person says yes. So people might look at Tate and say, oh, he was in that movie with Denzel, The Equalizer. He was in Jurassic Park. Well, what about the, let's just say, the 300 auditions he's gone on where they were like, okay. no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. Yeah. And <clears throat> he's probably like, I could quit. I could just try, and I think all, yeah. all our words are just up for interpretation. Like, I totally hear what you're saying. Like, I, I tried my best. Like, a lot of people are not trying their best. They're just coasting yeah. or not even coasting, and I get these emails every day. As much as I'm in my heart, I just want, I'm just i trying to teach people about training. It became I was motivating people, and that's no good because – you know, motivation eventually, sometimes I'm not motivated, and then I have to be disciplined to do the thing. But people email me every day about, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to succeed <clears throat> at my work. I'm trying to succeed as a business owner. I'm trying to succeed in the gym. And they just need one person to say, motherfucker, you could do it. Yeah. And uh, I sometimes need that stuff too. I'm always investing in a coach. I'm doing consulting calls. It keeps me on my toes, and sometimes somebody, like, we get so, uh, like, down our one lane, put the blinders on, you, 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 you're trying in the wrong realm. Mm. So I, I sometimes have somebody who is more open-minded than me. I do a consultation call, and they say, well, you keep talking about this. It seems like that's the direction you want to go in. So, you know, trying, I get it. <clears throat> from your perspective, at, you know, in leadership, from what Tate says, you know, I feel like, man, people are just very accepting of mediocrity. Yeah. It just crushes yeah. that. I don't know why that crushes me. Yeah. Probably because I'm thinking like Tate, like, dude, I know you could be better than who you are and what you are. And being a coach with young athletes every day, yeah. I go through this. So it's emotionally taxing, meaning I see a kid, it's like, dude, we just lost this year because... You're not trying. You're the gone this week, here next week, gone for a month, too busy. Then your dad comes in and says, oh, he's doing good. And I'm like, he's not. You're fucking lying, bro. Yeah. He's not doing good because you're making excuses. 
You know, like, <clears throat> do, you, do you hold them accountable like that? Are you talking to the parents? Yeah, like, bro. It is the worst way to run a business <laughs> because, you, you know, they're not ready like, for accountability, man. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I'm telling these kids straight up, like, don't show up unless you want to be the hardest worker in the room. And, um, you know, I'm selling hard work as the gateway to success. Yeah. That's not what people are selling. Like, what do we all see nowadays? Six weeks to this, two weeks to that, yeah, yeah. shortcut to this. In only five minutes a day, you could do this and that. Yeah. But look, it's like I always say, every overnight success story has the short, you know, has a uh, has the 10-year uh, history that we never spoke about. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Vision Board Podcast. You guys just came out of nowhere. Really, I just did 300 podcasts one week after the next. Yeah. It took all this work. Yeah. And I think <clears throat> that's what makes it hard for me because if I try to tone it down, then I go home and I'm like, I just I just cheated that kid because I didn't tell him, dude, you're fucking leaving it all out there. And, and a lot of times that generation is hard to understand. A 15, 16, 17-year-old doesn't get what it feels like to be 30, 40, 50 yeah. regretting what he could have, should have done. And that's what I do. So I, I get my my downfall is I get mad at people for not doing the work. And um, Gary Vaynerchuk always say. says, he goes, you know why I'm always happy? He's like, I got zero expectations. He's like, I give, give, give. I'll help, help, help. But I'm not I don't expect anything yeah, back in return. Yeah. See, I expect efforts. I expect you to do work and, um, <clears throat> you know, I could have I could have a lot more money if I just tr you know train general population, general fitness people showing up, and I'm not harping on you because I know you could be all state, all area, go to Division One college, compete in this, because I know that those things will shape their life either in a good way if they listen or in a if they don't listen they half ass it, then it's like it sets the stage for the rest of their life. Yeah. And I can't allow myself to go to sleep at night knowing that I've accepted less than greatness from somebody else. Mm. So it's like, <clears throat> how do you run a business that way? It's fucking nuts, but that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. Like, you yeah. can't, I cannot train anybody else. Like, this is what I do. Is that it's crazy. Zach, how do you handle the parents' part? You must get a few that like get in your face and obviously think that it's something they're not allowed in the gym. Do you do Do you do pre-consultations? Like, is it like a, you know? We do a trial. Okay. Yeah, we kind. It's kind of like that. We do a trial. Uh, <clears throat> it has changed through the years because of people's attention span with technology. Meaning, mm -hmm. when I first started training athletes. In the beginning, it was I lived with my parents. I trained them in the backyard and garage. It was just accepting a couple of neighborhood kids, so I knew them. Then when I uh, bought, when my wife and I, we were just actually just engaged. We weren't even married. We bought a house. It had a two-car garage. And for the first year, this house was such a shithole. We re had to redo the whole house. But the first thing we redid was the garage. Her uncles <laughs> um, sheetrocked the garage, painted it. I put in the equipment. It was like a real professional-looking studio, and I used to take them through a trial. And then when I opened the first warehouse location eight and a half years ago, you know, there was no uh, Facebook. Was Actually, Facebook had just started roundabout when I opened the gym because I remember uh, some of my kids were like, yeah, I'm not on MySpace anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm on Facebook. So back then, there was a bit more of an attention span. People would read the website. They realized that this guy's the fucking best. Now, people show up. I'm like, okay, did you read the website? They're like, no, I didn't have time. And, and I'm like, well, we can't do this trial. It, the website states, like, you do not sign up. It takes you five minutes. In my heart, what do I want to tell the parent? Really? That's your kid? You don't have fucking five or ten minutes to read that shit. Mm. So I do take them through a trial, and I want to see one thing, effort. Yeah. Um, I do get to assess them physically, but I already, honestly, like this is going to sound arrogant. When a kid walks in my doors, I know what he needs. I could look at his posture. I could look at where his feet are pointing. I could look at his physical structure. Um, and I can see it in his eyes if he's tough or not. I really can. Uh, so I know what of, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah like that, I know what this kid needs. 
that was going to be one of my questions about th those identifiers that um, so I think that it's really important so many people put so much emphasis on finding how to do things successfully in books or needing to go a certain route I like what you've done because you've always just kind of followed it within you like it's always you've, you've kind of let what's what's been burning inside just manifest itself into helping people and I guess my question is what is the catalyst? It's almost like you have a, an inner duty responsibility to give back and, and help these young and help these people. Is, was there a specific moment that you could look back when you were a younger guy or a catalyst of what the reason for that is? Because that's a, that's a beautiful thing and it's a rare thing. Yeah. So I trust my gut instincts, and the reason why is because you know I always talk about the two pains in life: the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. Uh, oh, and the saying is, the pain, well. of, yeah, the pain of discipline goes yeah. away once you taste success, but the pain of regret will haunt you for a lifetime. So I'm 40 years old, but I regret not wrestling that one year in college before they cut the program. I regret not going to Hawaii or even applying to try mm -hmm. to get in. I regret, you know, not knowing how to train or not learning how to have a different attitude um, when I had setbacks in high school. You know, I regret lost opportunities, so I'm pissed off for greatness, like Ray Lewis says. Like, I, I'm not into average, and some people don't care. They let it go, but uh, I know that I could turn any young athlete, not just into a success with the sport, but, like, if I could teach them to overcome those obstacles and all that stuff, I know that life will be easier for them. They will be more successful. They will just, you know, I listen, I see here and there I train adults, 30s, early to mid 40s. And this 45 year old, 35 year old guy is no different than the 15 year old kid. And the, and what I've learned is like, I got 45 year olds who they're not even confident in themselves. They're like unsure that they sound like this insecure kid, mm. and really they're just 20 or 30 years older, and they are the insecure kid. Why? Because nobody taught them any differently. Nobody coached them. Nobody pushed them. And um, <clears throat> it fires me up more and more because kids just need leaders. They need somebody to believe in them, or they won't believe in themselves. So I'm, I'm very, like, there's part of me that has, like, an anger as well as, a, an inner duty and my anger is damn it you could be fucking better or you know I got a kid trained with us last summer this is just one example of many he was so he was like a sloth he was fat he had no posture he couldn't even do a half squat like he was just like everything he was like uh, he was just a sloth and he was going to play football he was entering freshman year the summer ended and, uh, like, we were just starting to make some progress with him. And uh, leading up to that, like, he was missed out a week, then missed out two weeks. And I said to the, email the mom, I go, you know, he's missing his 9 a.m. workouts. Some of these kids, they sleep till, like, 12 noon. And I get it. We're all we're teenage boys. Sometimes you fucking sleep late. But, like, over and over, like, 9 a.m.? Like, you can't wake up twice a week to make a 9 a.m. workout when you live, like, literally, this kid lived, like, a couple blocks away. He would ride his bike to the gym. And mom's like, I'm just having a hard time getting him there. I'm like, hard time how? Like, you've paid for the membership, so the finances are taken care of. You know, what is going on? She's like, he's just not that motivated, and it's ultimately up to him. And uh, I replied, not totally the way I would like to, but I said, he doesn't know he needs you to believe in him. He's 14, so he doesn't know motivation. In fact, some kids aren't motivated, and we have to build it into them. But really what I wanted to say is, great fucking job. You just gave up on your son, and now we're sending him to the high school weight room. He can't do a bodyweight squat, but when he comes here, he told me he's squatting. Really? Like, this kid's back would round over... Mm -hmm you know, just yeah. picking up a pencil. So what the fuck's he squatting for? So I get yeah. mad that the parent doesn't care. Then they get sent to a weight room where a coach just stands there mm. who's not even skilled. And now, because that kid doesn't have the right leaders, 
he's basically fucked. Yeah. And that pisses me off bad. Yeah. Pisses me off bad because what's the most important thing? The kids. It's all about these kids. So, you know, as a parent, now that my kids are seven and nine, my schedule is like I'm either at the gym in the afternoons and evenings or I'm at tennis, I'm at wrestling, I'm at baseball. Guess what? It ain't about me. Mm -hmm. My fun, this and that. Hey, Zach, come hang out. I got to gotta run wrestling practice. I have to coach my son. I have to take him to wrestling. I got to take my daughter to tennis. That's what it's about. And I don't think people get that. I guess this is like a rant on fucking parenting and shit. I love that. But rants, that's, <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going on inside of me. Um, and like <clears throat> that, that was a big catalyst for why the I started my certification. Mm -hmm. I felt like if there was a lot of coaches calling my gym, emailing me, and I wanted to kind of build an army of coaches who would go out and change the world. But I found that it just was adding more like drama and separation amongst coaches. I didn't want that. I wanted a cohesiveness. So now I'm just strictly like I am more fired up than ever to train athletes and not train coaches. Uh, but ultimately, mm -hmm. like <clears throat> I need to, I think, find a way to develop a program that gets like incubated into the schools for training athletes. But it's hard, man. Schools mm -hmm. are so ass backwards. Yeah. To me, I think this should be school. Kids yeah. should listen to this podcast. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, my, my girl, I don't think they should be sitting down and, and, and the person is at the front dictating the shit. And it's crazy <laughs> that the teachers aren't even allowed, though, to write their own lesson plans. <laughs> they're they're being given. Now, for one, the we could go. For one, the learning style is from a student's perspective because I I got good grades in school. And that was just because I didn't want to upset my parents, but I hated school because it's like, here's a piece of paper, study this, write it down. You're not taught anything. And then from the teacher's perspective, they're just being told what to give the student. So it's just like messenger, messenger. There's no learning. And there's it's a no robot factory. It's yeah. a robot factory. So what I say is, and the guy said this to me uh, a week or two ago, the Power Athlete podcast, they go, all right, so what's the solution is? I think the solution is, you know, these gyms that, you know, guys like myself, they become the schools. Mm -hmm. And we do things in in our school. You know, it's like a school of strength for life. Yeah. Um, those We have to teach kids through that because I'm not going to change the public schools. That's the bottom line. Public schools don't want people like me. They, I'm just, <laughs> you know, I'll get fired. They don't like people like me. So I think coaches strength coaches we're not teaching them how to power clean how to squat we're teaching them how to utilize you know we're challenging them through the training to go out and kick ass in life so we create more people like us and i i know that sounds arrogant but uh you know that's goes back to the trying i'm just gonna i don't know what how it'll all work how it'll all pan out but um I don't want to be part of the Les Brown, you know, story of being the richest man in the graveyard because I keep my ideas to myself. And it's tough because I will get probably shot down a hundred times before yeah. one school says, hey, man, I think I, we really want you in here to, to help. Yeah. And that's the tough thing with being a gym owner for athletes is that there's no consistency. So we're wrestling against, you know, their football coach says, oh, you know, Johnny, Tristan, you guys have to train here or you will not play. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, the parents think that it's all the same. You know, I've had parents like, I'm like, oh, man, I didn't know your son was an athlete. Like, send him to me. I'll train him. He's like 150 pounds, skinny, yeah. weak kid. Ah, he's, he's good. He's at the high school. And I want to say he's not good. He's going to get fucking killed out there. He looks like a toothpick. But they don't know what they don't know. They're just... People are like in this, people are in that world, like Saturn or Mars. And I'm yeah. like down here trying to change and communicate with them. And uh, I, that's, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk says one is greater than zero. And that's where I've got to be at least a little bit happy with is that I want to change the world. Yeah, all right. I want to change the world. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if I will. Oh, but... Yeah. 
I'm going to change one, and it'll be the pay it forward model, and then they will change two. And some cool things are happening, like some of our athletes in college are coming back and doing the certification. And, and to me, that's like, whoa, it's pretty cool. We've had like close to 10 of my former high school athletes. Some of them start in middle school. Now they're in college. They're going through the certification, which tells me they will – they will go and, and spread the message or uh, they're helping um, their teammates on their college team because their strength coach maybe isn't pushing them enough. And now they're doing the extra stuff. So it's like, all right, we're, the army is being built in some shape or form. Yeah. It's not thousands or the millions. It's a few hundred or it's by the tens. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build. That's what, you know, I always say the Strong Life, Strong Life Podcast, and uh, the the gym is the vehicle to build the strong life. And that doesn't mean um, we're unbreakable. You know, I break down all the time, but now I know how to rebound, right? Like, oh, man, that shit fucked me up mentally. That fucked me up emotionally. But I, I will – you cannot – defeat me like you have to kill me i'm like the terminator <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> do you talk about this <clears throat> do you talk about emotions and and, and you know the, the introspective work with the younger guys because all the time because i feel that that's so important like back to the school you're not they're not teaching like what how it is to get your heart broken they're not teaching like you know going through these you know bad times that we just have to figure out as we get older and like that whole school, you know, school for strength for life in a perfect world. I think that they would all connect because, you know, you're strengthening yeah. the body, you're strengthening the mind. You're preparing these young people for this, you know, chaotic, bizarre, crazy life that they have in front of them. And it's crazier now than ever with back in the day. Like, I don't know how old you guys are. I'm 40. 34. So when I'm in high yeah. school, <clears throat> you know. No, I don't have to worry about, I'm not looking on Facebook, what's this guy, girl, what's everybody doing? Yeah. Now there's like no downtime for the brain to, <clears throat> you know, okay, that shit went down at school, I'm going to go home, I'm going to go to the gym. Now it's like, I leave school. Now, oh, somebody talking about me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat, or I don't even know yeah. these other ways that everybody's <laughs> communicating. Mm. But you said something, Johnny, like how to deal with your heart being broken. Yeah. That sounds very trivial, but nobody taught me how to do that. I remember the first girl I fell for, and she cheated on me. I was 18, and I did not know how to deal with it. And yeah. it sent me into such a downward spot. But, you know, if, if I would have had somebody that was like, dude, there's a fucking gazillion other girls out there. That's right. Who cares? And she did something wrong, you know, like nobody, yeah, everything was like, you have figure to figure it out, it out on, on your own. own. Yeah, man. Like, and I think it comes down to the, the leaders, the mentors, the coaches, because that working the body is just one aspect um, of like, you know, getting stronger and evolving. But yeah, these things happen. I know, I mean, I know when it happened to me. I was lost. You know, you just yeah, figured, it sounds trivial. But, yeah. And what about <clears throat> if you don't learn it when you're 18? Let's say you're married and you're in your 30s or 40s and that happens and you were never taught how to deal with it and now you've got kids, you've got work, all of that will crumble because you don't know how to deal with it. Um, and I'm sure you know the, the drug problem is kind of everywhere, but I, I see it a lot. Um, <clears throat> I have a friend that's a vice principal in the school and like so the vice principal deals with all the um, – um, like the, not the, not, not the school stuff, but kind of like the behavioral issues, the fighting, the drugs, and, uh, you know, kids show up to school drunk. I remember when I was in high school, like once there was like a group of a couple kids that smoked pot outside and came into school high and everybody was like, Oh my God, yeah. they were high. They smoked pot. Now it's like all of these kids are doing all kinds of drugs, this and that. I mean, there was a gym <clears throat> real close to the the area that I live in, a gym that was snagged for, I think it was like several hundred thousand dollar like drug ring. And um, somebody was like taking their kid there. He's like, dude, I didn't even fucking know. And he's like, I'm, I'm going there working out thinking they're all great people. And I'm like, yeah. And they were dealing drugs to kids Jesus. like your son. Yeah. And that's why I am, I am very, um, 
hard on kids. I've done crazy stuff, things I won't even admit. Yeah. <laughs> honest, but we've had um, kids <laughs> that come to the gym where it's a single mom, <clears throat> there's no father, and um, the cops have to drop the kid off at the gym. Um, like, there's just a lot of bad things that have happened. It's like, you, if, if I miss the boat with some of these kids for a little bit, I mean, we've had a lot of issues. Yeah. You know, even my, my younger brother, um, he does a lot of traveling. He does a lot of, like, hip-hop stuff. So he's always on tour. He's been sober for, I think, like 12 years now. But <clears throat> he, you know, our neighborhood, like, progressively got worse where we grew up. And it became normal for the middle school kids to start smoking pot and then to start doing all these other drugs. And then that led to him getting involved in crime and all these things. Then he went to jail and then he had, you know, got out of jail. And I always look back at, uh, <clears throat> my parents were delusional about the whole thing. Like, you know, like I couldn't ever find my socks. And I tell the story openly cause my brother speaks about it openly and, and you know, it's good for people to hear it. But I remember I was, was like, where the fuck are my socks? Where's my underwear? I go into his sock and underwear drawer and there's like wads of money. I'm telling my parents like, where the fuck? Do you think all this money's come from? They're like, oh, no, he's delivering pizza. I'm like, you dumb bastards. You don't fucking make all that money delivering pizza. So <clears throat> I've learned through all these things in life that you don't be delusional. And sometimes people need, like, the literal and figurative punch in the face to get that wake-up call. <clears throat> so I'm tough on everybody because <clears throat> you let anybody slide. You know, you give them an inch, they take a yard. People need to go through <clears throat> tough times so they become tough when things are, are tough on them. Otherwise, we break. And that's why I love things like, you know, all these, like what uh, Seal Fit does, how it, it challenges you mentally. Last year, um, my friend and I, um, it's it's all around the world, Spartan Race. I'm, I'm friends yeah, with Joe DeSenny, yeah, runs Spartan yeah, Race. Yeah. We yeah. ran a Spartan wrestling camp <clears throat> in his... Uh, where he used to live now he's in Singapore so in his Vermont backyard and we trained them yes but then there was yeah. always these breakout sessions where I would speak about mindset Joe DeSena spoke about mindset the uh, <clears throat> head wrestling coach that we brought in he spoke about mindset and uh, that wrestling coach um, he coaches Cornell University they're one of the best teams in the country but his father is like world renowned because his father wrestled, I think, at NC State or U University of North Carolina. I can't remember which one, but his father went to college after being in World War II. So they, he said, like, it was so easy for him to just go out there and wrestle mm. because he was coming from <clears throat> a time where, you know, he was fighting in a war where sometimes you didn't even fight guys with guns. You were charging at them with a bayonet, so, you know, like, so he. He's saying, like, today, everybody's like, oh, I'm so stressed out. Like, I need to go see the counselor. I'm going to transfer out of this college, go to that college. He's like, my dad came from the war. Wrestling seemed, like, so trivial to him, and he never lost a match. He won, you know, all national titles. And uh, <clears throat> that's just one example of he went through hell, and then everything after that, doesn't seem so hard, and that's why Joe created Spartan Race, because he said when he was in New York City, he's like, we work our asses off, then what do we do? We go to the bar, we spend money, everybody wants manicure, pedicure, the guys even want manicure, pedicure, their hair is, you know, perfect. He's like, we got so civilized, it just freaked me out, and I'm like, I'm, I'm fucking turning into a fat piece of shit, I sit behind a computer all day, so he signs himself up for that, like, crazy uh, race, and he's like, I going through that hell, I found myself. He's like, because if I would have stopped, I would have died. Yeah. You know, he's like, I would pee, and the pee would literally freeze before it hit the ground, and I had to drink olive oil. You know, he, we, I, that's why I think tough <laughs> workouts, as much as people, coaches want to talk about the science behind a, a, a workout, we cannot deliver scientifically perfect workouts anymore <clears throat> because... You know, oh, rest seven minutes between that set. You tell a 15-year-old to rest seven minutes and focus. It will never 
happen. We don't live in Bulgaria where <laughs> these guys don't have a phone or whatever the fuck's going on and they, you know, they just have in the training hall. It's just different. Mm. So when I look at what I need to do, it's so much more than um, training athletes to get their hand raised at the end of a wrestling match, win a football game and do all that stuff. You know, we've had a, a lot of losses at the gym, you know, from kids that have, <clears throat> you know, we've lost them to drugs, to crime and all these things. And it's like, damn, that's like if I could have, you know, held on to that kid, we maybe wouldn't have lost that kid. So, you know, I just feel like that that is my mission, even though from a business standpoint, what would be the smarter thing to do? Yeah. To train adult men and women, boot camps, fitness, 250 people, and I'd be oh. raking in the money. I was but it just this, doesn't actually. it just doesn't even inspire me 1%. Yeah. That doesn't inspire me. You just said about boot camps training a lot of people at the same time. <laughs> How many people do you think you can train effectively at once? Me personally? Yeah. <clears throat> a lot because I can I I can com I know how to command the attention of a room. I'm highly organized. I know how to control things. I know how to er organize the equipment, progressions, regressions. I know how to command a room. <clears throat> and I don't think, obviously, every coach is not the same. Mm -hmm. Some coaches would f be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, you could give me 30 to 40 athletes. If I have enough equipment, I could do some pretty kick-ass stuff. If I want to minimize it, I've trained 70-something football players uh, and wrestlers <clears throat> on an empty field with no equipment with just tremendous work. I mean, if all I did was that and then I taught them how to, like, farm or walk and deadlift on their own and dumbbell clean and press, like, I could build badasses. That sounds so contradictory to, like, I have all these books here, every scientific book sitting on my yeah. – <clears throat> up on the bookshelves, but <clears> – <throat> I feel like if I could just get them through our power warm-up, the athleticism, the coordination, the mental toughness, <clears throat> and then teach them some simple shit, I could train 100 people at once because exactly. I could command that, that room. Could you talk about what it, what it feels like? You, we mentioned earlier about you see a kid walk into the gym, you know, maybe their body language is – you, you could pretty much predict how, how it's going to end up kind of if, you know, where their mindset is in training – but what's, what's the opposite of that when you do see that kid and then he makes that turn and then he turns into like, you know, you, you've helped him evolve into a stud. Like, how does that feel for you? It's the, it's the best feeling ever yeah. because <laughs> the, be, the, the be, reason behind it goes back to what I said earlier. <clears throat> when I see this, when I, we talk about like he's a stud, mm. I'm not talking about like they're just winning more uh, for whatever the sport is. But, like, I see how they're um, applying that mindset to their schoolwork, to <clears throat> getting a job, to overcoming obstacles. <clears throat> so when I get these text messages from my college athletes or former college athletes, they're like, I'm just killing it. I'm this, you know, I got straight A's. I'm getting, you know, hundreds. I'm the hardest worker in the room. I'm leading the team. I know, and I'm applying for an internship. They're not, I see them going out there to become change makers of the world. That's what I see them becoming. Mm. And it's like, that's what I wanted. And uh, I don't care if the gym next door or next town or next state, if your guy, I don't care if your guys could deadlift, squat, bench press more than us. You know, that's just the surface. That's, you know what I mean? Like yeah. <clears throat> looking back, even like from a bodybuilding perspective, I remember my younger years, this one guy was huge and ripped, but his life was in shambles, and he, he was always crying and complaining about life. Mm. The only thing he had was a good body. You know, to me, that's like the ultimate sin. Like, what? It, that's not enough. Like, you need. Yeah. You, he was also a father, and he. It, I could only imagine he was like translating his, <clears throat> you know, complaining to his son. Now his son doesn't know what it's like to be strong, so. It's to me the best, you know, mm. it's, um, but I, I, I don't think like, to me that stuff's amazing, right? Yeah. But then it's like, um, when you, um, when you don't impact a kid, that's the worst. Like, you know, you're like, damn it. How did I, you know, where did I miss? Where, how come I can't change that kid? And what I really learned is 
<clears throat> there's if there's an inconsistency, meaning it's tough when you're with us. We're um, myself and my coaches. My coaches are fantastic. We're we're leading them. We're mentoring them. But then they go home and <clears throat> mom and dad make excuses for them, or don't challenge them, or then they go to school and then that coach doesn't push them, or that coach threatens them and says don't train them. Then we lose. Yeah. You know, I'm fighting against a lot of things in an effort to change these kids. So it's it's super hard. It would be, you know, my life would be easier if I just wasn't so passionate or learned how to not care. But I'm not like that. Like Gary Vaynerchuk could have no expectations. I expect everybody to be to try to be great. Yeah. That's it. I expect everybody to be kind to others. I expect other people not to gossip and, you know, add drama. But um, do you feel like do. you put? A, do you feel like you put a lot of? I mean, I know the answer, but you put a lot of pressure on yourself in regards to. Is there a, is there a need, or is it more like a your work isn't fulfilled if you can't reach everybody to the highest extent that you feel that you can? Because everyone's wired differently. I could see maybe, you know, what's the opposite end to the kid who comes in there and his parents um, aren't ready to hold him accountable, but the kid comes in there and the parents pushes him too much. And, like, do you, how, you know, dealing with that, that <coughs> aspect too. Yeah. And then because You're the, right. the kid could turn off then. Exactly. So what I've learned, and I picked up this lesson before I was ever a strength coach, I used to, uh, when I was going through graduate school, Saturday nights I was a bartender at a very old school shot and beer joint, and uh, next to the bar was the liquor store, and the guy who ran the liquor store was the uh, wrestling coach in that town, v straight up blue collar town, um, you're from Ohio, so you would understand, um, <laughs> Ohio I think lost this, they, they had the Ford plant was there, or the GM General plant? General Motors, yeah, Lordstown. Right. Yes. GM was in, um, maybe it was Ford. The The plant was in that town. <clears throat> it, like, employed almost everybody from that town. Yep. <clears throat> and I remember, so it was blue collar. And um, this is, so I'm like a third-year teacher, second year. So we're talking like 2000, the year 2000, maybe 2001, something like that. He says to me, um, you know, I used to really crush the kids the first week or two of practice. He's like, then I realized I lost a lot of good athletes who weren't emotionally ready for this intensity. Mm. He's like, so now I build them up a little bit softer. And uh, I, I picked up on that because kids have changed. Our environments have changed. When I used to first run trial workouts, they were just brutal. They were very, very hard. And I would just push the kid to see, do you want to be here? Like, do you really want to do this? And I had nothing to lose at all because I was a teacher. I was <clears throat> making very good pay. It was like I, I didn't even have to run that gym. My inter I had the internet business. Like that gym was this kind of like fight club being run on the side. Mm. Now I've learned that that scares kids. Yeah. I mean, I've had jujitsu black belts train with me, and they say, we can't get the other black belts here. They're scared. I'm like, really? Those guys could kill me in 10 seconds. They're scared. They're scared. There's our YouTube videos, our Instagram. My one friend told me, he goes, he goes, we used to post all these videos of our guys deadlifting, this, that. He's like, now we just post the videos of, you know, the quote-unquote soccer mom. I go, but that's not me, dude. <laughs> I'm training these kids to be fucking badasses here, there, everywhere. So, yes, I want kids to be inspired to say, I want to become like that. So I do, I slowly build them up, mm. but it's an everyday accountability thing. <clears throat> I am, I email our members every day. I check, our athletes are checked in in the beginning, like, what'd you eat for breakfast? Talk to me about lunch. Okay, let's make this change with breakfast. Um, what, do you, what did you eat since then? Okay, next week we're going to change that. What did you do today? Three pull-ups. Next week I want four. Mm. And then I'm building them up slowly, and then they start kind of buying into it. Yeah, now, not everybody buys in. 
I do feel that sometimes uh, some athletes and kids want to be quote unquote normal. They start getting to a point where they're like, and even though that most of our kids train just two to three workouts a week, for some kids they're like, oh, I just need to hang out with my friends. Oh, I got to go to the gym. I don't want to do that. I, I, I want everybody to be an ass kicker, but what's the bottom line? There's one gold medal. <laughs> yeah. There ain't five people don't get to share the gold medal. Five people don't share first place, and that and it's the human food chain. Yeah. You either want to be the predator, or you're going to be the prey. And I'm trying to build predators, and um, I'm <laughs> learning that not everybody want. Like you said, we're they're not wired that way. Like you come from Youngstown. A lot of people probably want to get out of Youngstown. The town I live in here, people inherit the house. They don't want to leave this town. They don't even, like, they go away to college, then they want to come back. I want to work in this town. Like, yeah. I don't, you know, that's you. safe. I, and some people, that's how they're wired. They want to be safe and, uh... It can be a dangerous well, thing, know. though. Like, mm -hmm. to live your life, like, being safe and comfortable in terms of, like, evolving, I think that is a dangerous thing way to think too to like not take risks because I mean that can lead over into the adult years and then next thing you know like you said you're 30 or you're 40 and you you, you haven't taken any risks and um, you know your time's almost up so I guess richest yeah we're part of Les Brown's uh, richest man, yeah, in the man dude don't go to the grave with greatness still in you that's the thing that resonates to me man I it's it, those, yeah. those words haunt me Zach how old were you when you left Israel Oh, I was young. We moved to this country. My parents said I learned to walk on the airplane. <laughs> said I was walking on the airplane. So I was like 11 months. We moved to the Bronx because okay. um, the, yeah. the way it worked was exactly my dad's right. from Romania. He moved to Israel. I um, can't remember what his age was. It may have been around like 10, 11, or 13. They moved to a kibbutz. My mom was born in Israel, so my dad worked on a kibbutz. And the way the story goes from what my mom always says is she's like, your father, your grandfather, your father's dad said, you got to go to America. America's, you know, the land of opportunity. So my dad went to engineering school in uh, Israel. You know, they went to the army. Both my parents were in the army. And um, I think my, I, either my aunt was already living in the Bronx or my dad's uh, father already moved. So we moved to the Bronx and lived in a uh, section called Riverdale, which is supposedly still in, in, like the nicer area of the Bronx. It's on the river. Uh, my aunt still lives there. It's pretty nice. And uh, we lived there, I think, to like three or four. And then we moved to New Jersey <clears throat> in um, this small, um, it's like a town called Woodbridge, but we moved to a little area called Fords. And when I sometimes when I go to my gym in Edison, which is near there, I exit there on purpose to go through that town because it's it is it's kind of like it's a little bit I think like Youngstown, like yeah. people have like things haven't changed. The downtown just doesn't develop like it's just a bunch of like auto garages and like some yeah. you know little delis and shit. And it's like I go through there for reminders of. The time I got beat up in the parking lot. Or, you know, if you stayed here, or this is where you could be if you don't try. You gotta try. So I go through there, and it it just keeps me grounded. You know, a lot of people, what's weird is, I try to explain, like, I'm just like you. Because they email me, and they think I'm, like, some great greatness, some great person, or something like that. And I'm like, man, I'm just like you, but I'm just fighting harder. You know, I got all the same things going on as you. Like, I, I yeah, wake up sometimes. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm also tired. I'm also having a hard time with this or that. But um, I'm, I fight, you know, and I don't want, I hate losing so much because I've lost before. Hmm. And it's so painful to lose. Or they say, like, you know, a great, uh, somebody who's a winner they don't love to win as much. It's like they hate losing. Yeah. And um, it's crazy. Like I have that competitive nature in yeah. me. Like 
we have a fishing derby in this town, and in my mind, I'm like, I don't, I'm gonna fucking beat the seven year old. Like, I don't want to even <laughs> lose the fishing derby. Yeah. You know, like, I, I don't even want, I don't want to lose the goddamn fishing derby. Like, I don't even want to lose anything anymore. Yeah. It sounds, you know, I laugh at it too, but um, you know, I just keep reminding myself, like, man, you gotta keep fighting. And uh, I don't know what <clears throat> the future holds for somebody like me. I've, I've had <clears throat> offers um, from uh, some universities and some big schools mm. where they want somebody like me in there consistently as the strength coach. And yeah. there's, a, there's an attraction to that because I've, I've learned that it is very difficult to impact this younger generation lately, the past few years, because... We're battling the bullshit. We have coaches that threaten them. We have parents who don't know the difference between <clears throat> an excellent strength coach and Johnny Average on the corner who just, you know, got whatever certification. So uh, there's a little attraction to that of, like, maybe that will reduce my uh, – I'm so fired up that it, it probably my intensity probably stresses out um, other people around me. <laughs> they can't they can't handle that fire. You know what my girlfriend always tells me? She's like, Johnny, you need to read the room, and and she always talks about referring to my energy because good advice. It, yeah, it, 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 it's yeah. something I always think about. Zach, we we use this platform um, to to provide inspiration and motivation for our listeners. Could, could you talk, you know, somebody struggling with something, could you talk a little bit about um, some inspiration that, that works for you maybe when you're struggling? Um, well, I just think about my kids, like, um, I can't show you but because my phone's on Periscope, but that's it. I think about my kids, and my measuring stick is always, <clears throat> okay, you got to go home at the end of the day, end of the night, and now you got to tell your kids what you did that day. So I could say, guess what daddy did? <laughs> Nothing. Daddy gave up today. Lazy ass. Gave up. It got hard. Quit this. Don't do that. It was tough. But I don't want, you know, to have to tell them that. So <clears throat> I want always, if I'm going to uh, tell them what I've done, like, I need them to know that I gave it everything I had. So uh, when I think about what I'm doing, it's always, you know, if somebody doesn't have a family, What's your why? Like, you've got to discover that. We all have a why. So <clears throat> for me, what, you know, really hit me lately is like, okay, I'm putting in these kind of spreading out my energy, trying to educate coaches and trying to train athletes. But uh, what I realized is a lot of people are not like me. They're realizing that training athletes is too hard, too difficult of a business. So they're just <clears throat> training you know, oh, I'm just going to train adults. I'm going to train adults. Well, I realized that, man, I'm trying to uh, put my uh, my goals and my vision and, and want other people to have it, but people aren't going to take it. So I said, you know what? If I'm going to tell my kids that I'm not I'm not working with coaches anymore, then they got to know what, what's the reason why. My my whole reason behind that is like now I could do not just my 50 percent of pushing these gyms to you know, change the lives of athletes to create the school of strength, but 100%. So everything comes down to what's your marker, <clears throat> what is like, you know, if you're going to let somebody down, imagine for somebody, let's say they don't have kids, it's the end of your day, and you get to st stand in front of a room or step on stage in front of 100 people, 50 people, one person, and you got to tell those people, what did you do today? And your story is either going to, you know, help them live a greater, stronger life, or it will, you know, dig, put them into the graveyard. <clears throat> and now you put a little bit of pressure on yourself to be better, you know, or as Tate says, I just need, I need you to try, people. Yeah. And um, we're just, you know, the world is a crazy place, I think, lately, mm -hmm. <laughs> with everything that's going on. And if we don't try, you know... No matter where you live in this world, like, the world will just crush you. So you got to just fucking go for it. I mean, I don't see any other way, any other way to live anymore. 
Zach, who taught you to write? Because I, I love your blog, man. Like, I've been going through a yeah, few articles. Yeah, that's such and... a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. What, uh, I don't, I was, uh, I, I don't know if I was thinking this to myself the other day or, but, um, so I wrote a book, The Encyclopedia of Underground Strength mm. and Conditioning, really big book. And uh, when I finally, like, sent the final draft to John Duquesne at Dragon Door, I was like, how funny is this? I failed first marking period English senior year in high school. <laughs> like, my guidance counselor was like, school is just, it's like college is just probably not in your card, Zach. Like, your SAT scores. Uh, like you probably need to just go to this community college because I was getting uh, declined for all admissions in college. <clears throat> and um, when I got into college for, uh, freshman year, the first class I had was creative writing, first class. And it was an adjunct professor, <clears throat> and he said, just call me Tony because if you call me Mr. Whatever, I'll look around looking for my dad. And uh, he taught us how to write creative writing and uh, the first story I had to write he said like write about your most memorable time and I wrote about the first wrestling match I won and um, I didn't think it was gonna be inspiring to anybody but I spoke about how like I go in I get in on the guy's leg I take him down he reverses me he puts me to my back and I had never won a wrestling match yet I'd been training freshman year I went oh and whatever I didn't win one match I went through so much hard training leading up to that, and I feel like I'm getting pinned. Like, I must have been a hair from the referee slamming the mat. I feel like I'm going to get pinned, and I'm, like, wondering what the clock is, and I'm like, holy fuck, it's about to start all over again, all these losing again. And then something in me just says, just fucking fight back for crying out loud, and I'm writing this. <laughs> Exactly as I'm talking, like, in my head, my brain is like, fight back, motherfucker. <laughs> and my body's like, yes, now fight. And then I'm talking about fighting back, getting off my back. Next period starts, I take him down. I've got him on his back. I hear him, like, breathing heavy. And then he's, like, screaming, like, I can't breathe while I'm trying to pin him. And I wrote this whole thing, this whole story. And then it finishes with, I get my hand raised. And I had been waiting, like, 18 months since the beginning of Train for Wrestling to get that. <clears throat> so he's explaining how creative writing has to make somebody feel like they're in it with you. And um, I'm waiting for some other kid to read their story. So he goes, I'd like Zach to read this story to you. And I'm like, Phew. and this is a time in my life where I didn't believe in myself for nothing. It's like the first or second week of college. I'm having a hard time with college. I don't know if I should be there. And this guy's like, I want Zach to read this story. And that taught me to just um, unleash. When you write, <clears throat> do not filter anything. And uh, don't be afraid to hurt somebody's feelings. And um, so I write unfiltered. And, of course, it's gotten better because I've been writing since I was 17 years old when I was in college. I wasn't even 18. So now I'm 40. So what's that, 23 years of writing? And I would always write just in general. I don't, you know, I'd always like, even as a kid, I would write workout programs. And when I would write a workout program and give it to somebody, there'd be like a little story or something in there. It wouldn't be like bench press, pull up. It would be like bench pull up. I'd be like, and when you're in there, just fucking grab that bar and crush it in your hands. And like, <laughs> there was all these notes yeah. to like make the kid feel. And, uh, I just wrote, and uh, now what's interesting is I send out, you know, pretty much a daily email, and I don't even give a fuck if anybody reads it or not. I write it almost like I'm writing it to myself. Mm. Like, it's my um, like expression. therapy. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's hard. You know, you guys are together. Yeah. I don't have a partner or teammate where I'm, like, sharing these things with bouncing ideas off of them I'm just like a one man army so I'm good with that maybe it will evolve one day but when I write I'm not writing to the masses I'm writing kind of as a therapy for myself and I'm writing to just that one person who needs to hear it that's yeah. it and uh, <clears throat> I'm okay with the changes that have happened through the years with like uh, somebody had posted on my YouTube recently and actually I'm a lot like, how the fuck does this video only have 500 views? Whereas, like, this other stupid video has 
50,000, 500,000. They're like, yeah, what the fuck? Everybody should watch this. Well, when I make my videos now, I'm just talking to the person who emailed me the question. Mm. Like, I know it's not for everybody. And um, that's, I think, when you write, um, don't worry about the rules, number one. Number two, make them feel like they're in it with you, like they're friggin' in it. And um, the other thing I'd like to say with creation in general, whether it's a writing or you create something, whether it's tangible or you're like phone consultation for business or whatever, the minimum effective, the minimum effective dose, the minimum goal should be that, um, well, can I pause this for a second, guys? Yeah, My wife's calling. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're in trouble. <laughs> hey, babe. I'm gonna check on him. I'm doing a podcast, but he he was doing he was doing good. He's upstairs chilling out, and I'm gonna be done in like 15 minutes. He had a little fever, but he he said he didn't want to do another Tylenol. All right. Uh, it was like 101.1. So don't. He said he didn't want it, and I'm afraid like giving him another Tylenol or Advil or any of that shit. I just I don't know. He said, I'm, he said, I'm fine. What? What'd you say? If it's under 102. All right, good. Bye, babe. Who runs the Sorry, show? Man, I'm not even going to edit that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even going to edit that. I'm just going to leave that on until you... The lady. Okay, yeah, you can leave that on. <laughs> we, are at, we are at the mercy of the woman. Do you know, it's interesting, like, when we were still hunters and gatherers 10,000 years ago, I'm going to reference one of, one of the only teachers, professors who inspired me. You mentioned your creative writing, Dr. Adrian Novotny. He, he taught me a cultural anthropology class at Long Beach City College. But he was saying that 10,000 years ago when we were, we were still hunters and gatherers, the woman was the leader of the tribe. Because we thought she was magical because we, we didn't know why she was reproducing. And, and uh, it, still, what, it still shows up. She's still running. Yeah, you know, like, I'm always like, man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> if my wife isn't, like, tell me what to do. <laughs> thank God. But, like, she's a nurse, so she's smart with these things. Like, I, I, I mean, for the guys that are, she's calling me again. Uh, Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> You're in trouble. Okay, guys. <laughs> What's up, oh, man? All right. I just had to check on my little guy. So just talk, talking about, like, women being, like, the, the magical. Yeah. I mean, it could be – men could be magical, too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> as, as corny as that sounds because sometimes I think of, like, you know, we're guys, and you probably know other guys. Like, they could be in a, in a – uh, like, a poisonous relationship where that mm. – person if that if that girl isn't like as upbeat or as positive and bringing the guy down and vice versa mm. you know but i think you know if we're speaking of like men women men have to be strong i am a, just a believer in like that's our duty what like, type of strength physical, though like how, how do you defy strength are we just talking i'm gonna say both i'm gonna say <clears throat> physically we should be strong we should be able to run jump we should be able to carry our kids, carry things like old school, caveman yeah, protect, type stuff. Right? Protect. Yes. And then also mentally and emotionally strong because women need that from us and other people in general. People look for men to lead, to care, and I think that that stuff's crucial. And the reason why I say that is when I have like kids that I train – if the father is like, eh, wishy-washy, like, it's like we cannot impact the kid because he goes home and then the dad's like always oh, got an excuse about this, that, and everything else. So that is not a strong man, even if he could deadlift 500 pounds. Yeah. He's not emotionally strong. I mean, I think that's our duty. Uh, if I'm talking about what's good for everybody is everybody needs mental and emotional strength because life is just filled with these up and down times um man my buddy joe DeSen always goes he's like uh, for entrepreneurs he goes everything that will go wrong can go wrong 
right when it's going great, you lose your best employee or, you know, you lose like the sponsor or you lose the venue. And uh, man, it's so true. And I guess like we either let it um, hold us down or we harness that, you know, experience and those emotions to fuel us for something greater. And I try. That's what I try to do. Mm -hmm. um, that is what I do probably 98% of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to say I'm successful all the time, but uh, it's pretty hard to keep me down, to hold me down. It's because I learned a lot about the mind through self-education, podcasts, you know, in the early days before podcasts, I was um, just a very aggressive learner of book reading from uh, Tony Robbins. I was buying all of his uh, audio CDs. I mean, when I first started getting into the, uh, if we would call it self-improvement, self yeah, self dude, I, I still to this mm -hmm. day just barely listen to the radio. Yeah. Unless like my kids or family are in the car, it's always podcasts back in the day. I, I still have so many CDs here, yeah. and um, do you like Jim Rohn? What's that, Jim, Jim Rohn? Oh. I mean, I've got so many of them. Yeah. And look, people might say that's a motivational speaker. You know, N Napoleon Hill, all these think and grow rich. Like I have all like of those Thomas? things. I was a big. Uh, remember when the Secret came out? Yeah. yeah. Do you like Eric I Thomas? I would follow Zach? Zach. What's that? Do you like Eric Thomas? Eric, yeah, yeah, I yeah. love how he's freaking just. I love he's in the weight room. <laughs> What's that? He's like he's like epitomizes like actually in the weight room doing his motivational yeah. stuff. And you know what I always say to myself? I'm like, man, if that was available to me when I was younger, yeah. I think it would have like lifted me. Yeah. And I don't know why kids aren't maybe they are or yeah. me, I don't know, but like I see him, I watched one of his videos recently, somebody shared. He was with uh, I think at a University Mich University of Michigan. And um He's like, you talk about being a beast until it's time to do what beasts do. And then he said, you know, what a beast does is like, you go out and hunt. He's like, so if you beat somebody that's already down or hurt, he's like, you are not a beast. You're not yeah. the true predator. And he talks about basically the pain of discipline versus the pain of regret, yeah. you know. And I don't, I just think sometimes it's hard for a, teenager or a college athlete to grasp that and I've worked with college athletes and um, they're just kids man they yeah. just you think differently when you're 19 20 21 you you always think like there's next time there's the next opportunity um, but it, I have learned time and again that that's not the case yeah. there's there's always something you know, there's always this opportunity and the chance of something might stop you. Yeah, have you read any Eckhart Tolle? Um, who's that name again? Eckhart Tolle, like The Power of Now. He taught. He, Eckhart. Yeah, he's, he's he's Canadian. He's written The Power of Now. He's written um, Stillness Speaks. But he's really all about the illusion of the past and the illusion of future. Neither one of them yeah. is like both of them are not. They're not real. The only thing. That's, oh yeah. The only thing that's you know, real. Is right now. Dan Sullivan says that yeah. also from uh, <clears throat> um, Strategic Coach. And he says, he calls it the gap. He yeah. goes, so the gap is basically like it's this uh, perfect thing that you're visualizing. He's like, but it's, it's kind of like the, um, it's like the sunset. You're driving in your car. Um, you think you're getting closer to it, but you're never really going to touch it. You can't grasp it. Yeah. And he goes, if you are stuck in that gap, which is like what you think is perfect versus where you're really at, you'll never be happy. Mm. He's like, because you always think it should be that way versus With versus him. what we have now. Yeah, it's it's really important. Awesome. Um, Zach, it's obviously it's just about to go 3 a.m. in the morning here, actually. Yeah. Oh, well, so. shit. Literally, while everyone's sleeping, yeah. man. We're out, you know, this is what, we love to do love this. To Tristan do. looks tired. Yeah. But I, I still got one question for you, Yeah, we got, we, got the, we got a really important one for you. One question I ask Ooh. everyone. It's a personality question, my man. Okay, yeah. Zach Evanesh, you've got five invites to a dinner party. You can't invite any of your close family or friends. No wife. No wife. No kids. Dead or alive, who are your five invites going to, my man? Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger would be one. Tony Robbins, looking at my book here. 
I'm looking at my bookshelf. <laughs> um, I hear an echo. Sorry. Ah, damn. I'm looking up at these. Uh, man, this is a tough one. Uh, um, Warren Buffett. Oh, yep. Number three. Number four, this is an interesting one. Um, Rick Rubin, the music producer. Mm. Someone else said yeah, that. Somebody else said Rick Don't Rubin. Know, no, no. Rome, uh, Adam Bornstein. Bornstein. Do you know, yeah, yeah, Bornstein said the same I, thing. I know Born, yeah. Good yeah. friend. I love that guy. He said the same thing. Rubin. Rick Rubin. Go yeah, ahead. Rick Rubin. Trying to think of somebody that really just came, that really like came from nothing. That's what I, that's what I want to hear about. Um... Damn, and I know I'm gonna regret because I missed something. So that's four people so far, right? You got one more, man. You got one more. <sighs> man. And it can't be a family member, huh? Nope. Wow. Um looking at these books. Man, that's a great question, guys. You stumped me a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you got um, it? Who do you um, remind yourself at- of? <laughs> Who do I remind myself yeah, of? Yeah, there has to, something like that. There has to be somebody that you, you know. I'm trying to think of people. I I love people that like are like immigrants or they kind of come from nothing and they they fight their way to the top. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, Seth Godin. Seth Godin. I'm looking at a Seth Godin book. I I think Seth's got. He's just got such a unique way of. Thinking about things and like he's totally okay with not fitting in or not conforming, and mm-hmm. he sees like he does his own thing. You know, he sets he, his own path. Yeah, yeah, like he's like, dude, it's it's okay to not be like that. Be who you are, but now you could try to do this. Yeah. So I I feel like somebody like Seth and Rick Rubin would say, man, th- this seems like what you're about. You should go in this direction because sometimes I feel like I'm not progressing or doing what I'm meant to be doing. Like, I haven't evolved enough. So Seth, Rick Rubin, that would really get me fired up. Tony Robbins, I think, would get me on this, like, big level of thinking. Arnold Schwarzenegger, of course, always been an inspiration, but I would ask him some controversial questions, such as um, uh, the reason, like, behind why um, supposedly he bought a lot of um, the rights to pumping iron because he wanted, when he was running for governor, supposedly he pulled out like the parts where he said some like bad things about uh, certain races and things like that. Yeah. So I would ask him some controversial questions. Yeah, why not? Um, yeah, and then we said, uh, so we said Rick Rubens, Tony Robbins, Seth Godin, Warren Buffett. I would be asking him about finances and mm-hmm. lifestyle because, from mm-hmm. what I understand, he still lives in like his original home. He's a minimalist. Yeah. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, okay, you live in your original home. Like, where's all this money going from? Like, how should we invest? But I want to invest not just so I have money for my family, but I need, I feel like I need to find a way to create like an organization or maybe a nonprofit. And I can't put my finger on it. And I would love to kind of connect with him about that bigger, um, you know, bigger way of thinking, of course, being strategic financially. I don't, my wife does a lot of that, like all of our investments, and I've got all of the, um, like the pension and the retirement funds and all that stuff. But I want to hear from the guy that just fucking mastered the mm. game. Yeah, excellent. That was Zach. A easy ass dinner. Yeah, yeah definitely, man. <laughs> yeah, cool. Organize that for you. <laughs> um, cool, Zach. Just before you leave, uh, where can everyone find you online and on your social medias, man? Simple. Um, the uh, website is zachevnesh.com, which is the same as undergroundstrength.tv. And then on Instagram and Twitter, zevnesh, Z-E-V-E-N-E-S-H. If they just Google, like, Strong Life Podcast, Underground yeah. Strength, everything kind of starts popping up all over Google, and that's the easiest way to hit me up. Thanks, man. Zach, thanks, thanks so much for your time, man. I'm sorry I kept you guys hanging. My, this right. has been a crazy week no, with. Uh, not at all, man. We we'll have to get you back on because I think we've only just touched this. Yeah. As well, man. Yeah, we choose. Yeah. We choose to do this, and uh, we really appreciate your time. You guys ever head out uh, to the states or? Yeah, uh, all the time, man. We're gonna actually be there probably in June. We'll man. be there in June. My my whole family. 
Well, we haven't decided yet, but we'll probably be on the East Coast. If we're at East Coast, we'll probably hit you up, man. We can go for a beer. We should definitely, uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely we have... come by. If it's June, we'll go surfing. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. So we got... <laughs> So we have uh, probably going to be Northeast Ohio, Western Pennsylvania initially, and then you down to American Top Team in um, South Florida. I was just there. Yeah, I was yeah. just there. Yeah, good friend of mine. She fights. She's hurt right now, but um, Alex Chambers. She. I don't know the names, yeah. but uh, there was a couple girls in that group that I yeah. warmed up, and uh, my friend is the wrestling coach there, uh, Steve Monko. Uh, well, all right, cool. Yeah, so um, we're. we're we co- there's a sports science is this ISSN there's an ISSN thing down there in I think June and uh, nice. yeah we'll probably set something up down there but yeah enjoy your day man and thanks for your time we'll be in touch thanks a lot guys so, exactly. Appreci- this was <laughs> The Vision Board Podcast, hosted by Johnny Stofko and Tristan Cannell.